The adopted motto on this channel, where these contemplation notes are shared with any who may wish to listen and contemplate themselves, has always been, truth speaks no words. When we take into consideration that words are the third level of programming language for the mind, that they are symbols that generate inside the mind concepts that need not be present in the immediate reality, then it becomes evident that they are a tool that assist both the contributor for the arising of healthier characters and also the enslaver who would prefer unhealthy characters or none at all, so that the mind may then fall prey to shadows. Now, a shadow is an inverted reflection of a living aspect, an ugly and twisted copy of it, that nevertheless reveals to that living aspect, like an image in the mirror, its own potential for falsehood and death. It was stated that words are the third level of programming language for the mind, because in the first two levels, almost inseparable are images and emotions. By image, I mean a complete or partial symbolic context that provides a thought, so it is not necessarily visual in the sensory field. By emotion, I mean a response, a reaction that shifts the mind and body into a mode or mood. Of course, an emotion can be a reaction to a thought, a word, or an image, yes. But emotions often work automatically, some innately programmed, others programmed through experience, to prepare the mind and body for a potentially quick needed reaction. Also, emotions have direct access to all these levels, permeating them being somewhat omnipresent. So, any of these, be it an emotion, an image, or a word, may form a thought. It is worthy of note that all these are tools and, therefore, not necessarily good or evil, useful or dangerous. A knife is a tool that may be useful to provide nourishment and may also be dangerously used for injury and destruction. If, as the saying goes, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so is the intent in the responsible choice of any tool's wielder. Now, contrarily to reactive thoughts, that is, thoughts that emerge formed as a reaction or response to an emotion, an image, or a word, independent thoughts may also emerge in the mind by themselves, that is, wordlessly and without image or emotion. When this actually occurs, when there is actually no emotion, image or word giving rise to that thought, it is what we would call creativity, given that it is a thought that is new not previously programmed, and therefore independent of the context currently experienced by the mind. It is important to make the distinction, because even thoughts that seem to have not been formed as a result of an evident external stimulus may be brought about by an action inside the mind from an internal shadow. But in those cases, there is always either an emotion, an image, or a word first, at least, if not all of them. So a thought that arises in the mind without any of these tools then has to be translated so that the mind character may be able to process it. How is this done? Of course, it needs to be translated into a word or several words, an image or an emotion, or a conjunction of these tools. This act of translation is, in fact, an act of reflection on the part of the mind, because that mind character can only use the tools that it has and that it knows how to use to attempt a translation. So the resultant creation will bear its creator's imperfections. That act of reflection is therefore an act of creation. Consequently, 
the final result of that thought translation, be that end result a word, an image, or an emotion, will always be a shadow of the original thought itself, carrying with it, subconsciously, the tonality of its creator. I say subconsciously because that is where shadows exist. It will never be the actual, original thought, and it will never do it justice. As an example, when you hear me often struggling in this channel to translate thoughts into words, you will note that these translations always carry the defects and the virtues that my mind held at that particular time. I still do it for the purpose of communicating aspects that I find important, so that they may, in some miraculous way, lead your minds to arising your own original thoughts as well. For many years I listened to others try to do the same, others who were very useful in my path. It is only fair that now I attempt to do the same, knowing that I will always fall short, given the very nature of the translated reflections. But the tools we have are as they are, and limitations may motivate us to elevate our attempts and, consequently, elevate our characters in the process. Contemplating a very pertinent and perceptive comment left by Fiona Needham in the previous video, thank you very much, Fiona, led to a realization that is related to all this, that what is called conscious mind, where words and images dwell, is in fact the subconscious, because words and images are reflections, or shadows, of original thoughts, and so they inhabit the level below thought. Consequently and inversely, what is called subconscious mind is in fact the conscious, because that is where thought, without any translation into words or images, exists. In between these two is the ego, who is supposed to be the guardian of the mind and the responsible decision maker, a king receiving input from both these metaphorical advisors. In a healthy mind, the ego then decides and generates the mind characters that are the face, the persona, the mask worn to interact in the unconscious level. The character is not a whole and living being, so it is protected from being overwhelmed by amnesia. This is why, again, I reiterate, in a healthy mind, these mind characters reside and relate to each other in the unconscious level, where they are shielded both from overwhelming memory or too much knowledge that would paralyze or outright destroy them. The ego, however, a healthy ego that is, is able to deal with memory and knowledge, given that it is its function as a guardian and decision maker to choose a course in between all forces and all advisors. The ego has also another function, additionally, that of the communication line between the true living essence outside of the mind and the world and the surrogate experience of the characters in the realm. That line of communication that is supposed to be centered at the ego is a two-way line. Inspiration may come from truth and manifest upon the surrogate realm and experience, and consequent wisdom acquired in the surrogate dream may go back to the truth, all of this via the ego. Allegorically, if we all decide to play a role-playing game together, we will create characters that represent our surrogate selves, while we remain the decision-makers then we will place these characters into a context that we would otherwise never experience, precisely to force us into contemplating unconventional contexts, unseen consequences of choices and potential forces that never were before manifest in us. Exactly, so that through that surrogate experience, 
we may see our own reflection, to know ourselves better and become wiser. And, contrastingly, the risk of over-identification with our character in such a game is there as well. We may risk turning the love and responsibility for that personage into identification and addiction. To further contemplate on that allegory and to ponder potential results of addiction to such a game, I would suggest revisiting the contemplations named Role-Playing Game and Dungeon Masters. I must also state that this entire presentation is closely related to other two contemplations as well, named Spells and Rituals and Alchemy, that may also be useful to revisit as they may complement this one. I would just then finish off with a speculative hint in regards to what I observe. There seems to be a background reason for reality to appear to us recently, more like a cartoon or a caricature, than its usual attempt at presenting itself as a coherent and seemingly organic experience. Something that had remained more or less constant in the realm over the years of our lifetimes was that reality always tried to cover up its imperfections, to put on makeup and try to convince us that it was truth. That is seemingly vanishing. Reality is no longer patching up its facade and seems to, in fact, be removing it gradually, altogether, and exposing itself. It may be that it now wants to be seen for what it is, if reality had any volition of its own and by itself, and may want to discern the characters and egos and souls that see the caricature in the mirror from those that adapt unquestioningly to impersonating a cartoon character as if they themselves and reality had always been that way.